So this uh, webinar will be on uh, distance communication. Uh, we're doing this in a series of webinars to support uh, DUPC2 partners and uh, others who are interested to, uh, yeah, to discuss in these times that we have to change our way of working, to use uh, uh, tools and to use good practices and to share our knowledge. So we are also, we're not only broadcasting our ideas to you, but we also want to know uh, what kind of solutions you have and what kind of challenges you face. And then we can see where we can help each other. Um, so I'm supported by uh, Wim Duven, the coordinator of the DPC2 program. There's uh, Nadine Sander, who's also regularly in touch with the, the partners together with Kimberly Wakari. And from the, um, from the e-learning team, uh, Raquel Dos Santos and uh, Jipke Koster. And uh, I'm Hans van der Kwast. I'm the coordinator of the e-learning uh, projects with our partners from DPC2. And uh, yeah, I, I'm very happy to have this uh, webinar for you to share some good practice. But as I said, I'm also uh, eager to learn about your ideas and challenges and solutions. So first I want to set some uh, rules here. That's very important. And many of you are probably new to Yitzi. I'm gonna explain what Yitzi is later, but uh, please mute your microphones during this uh, um, webinar and until where, where we go into the plenary discussion there you can uh, raise hand and uh, unmute yourself so please also don't use your camera during the presentations it uh, disturbs but uh, also in the plenary if you feel like uh, showing your face uh, feel free to then uh, start your camera and uh, please use the chat box to ask the questions now you see that uh, the european union is now also moving their uh, uh, their online, their communication, their their meetings to online, uh, and they're of course discussing the, the issues that we have with uh, with the budgets and, and all the member states. And uh, yeah, we also have things that we need to discuss and still keep the discussion going on. So in Yitzi, you see here on the right, you see um, the different buttons that you can use during this meeting. So uh, when we have the plenary discussion, you can use the raise hand button to uh, draw my attention and uh, you can then unmute yourself if I, I mention your name and then uh, you can ask your question or contribute to the discussion. There's this button, you hopefully found it already for the public chat. You can uh, introduce yourself there with your, your name, your organization and your country, but also post your questions there, they will be answered and uh, some of them will also be uh, used in the plenary discussion. Then a very important uh, button is the mute and unmute microphone button. So only unmute when uh, you get uh, the word uh, in the discussion. Otherwise, please keep it muted. And the same for your uh, camera, switch on your camera only in the plenary discussion. So just a few uh, rules. They also apply as good practice to, to share those rules with your participants of your online meetings. So DUPC2 and distance communication. Uh, as part of your DUPC2 projects, you, of course, uh, have many things planned for the year and many workshops also in this time. And yeah, unfortunately, you're faced by the challenge uh, that many of those workshops or all of them actually <laughs> cannot go on in the normal way that you want to do it, especially if it's transboundary and outside of your institute and you have to travel, you face all kinds of difficulties. Now, we don't want uh, that things stop completely. And uh, we therefore organize these webinars also to uh, yeah, to assist you in moving these face-to-face -face webinars, face-to-face uh, -face meetings to, uh, to webinars where you can still meet with all people across the world in a digital environment. But that's, of course, not the same as face-to-face. -face. And uh, it will also not replace all the things that you can do face-to-face. -face, but if we follow certain good practices, then uh, we can make it equivalent and even efficient. So therefore, it's important that uh, in this webinar, we share our good practices and, and challenges so we can uh, make the most out of this period where we really have to rely on uh, digital communication, online communication. So there are many tools around, but before we are choosing a tool, and I know people have their favorites for many reasons, I always like that we start from the features that you need. And uh, I made a bit of a word cloud here on the left. and. Uh, it depends, of course, on you as a user, what you find most important. But uh, what I find important is you can do this exercise by yourself to determine your features of the tool that you require. But of course, we all want an audio connection. We want to see each other from time to time. So video is important. We want to share a screen like I'm doing now. We want to um, 
discuss things in a, in a private in a public chat but you can also discuss things maybe in a private chat if you want to uh, discuss with uh, team members uh, separate from the from the whole group um, what we also want is to uh, to raise hand when we have uh, questions you might want that uh, share a whiteboard where you can do brainstorming and uh, maybe collaboratively work on a document uh, watch a video simultaneously that's also possible with some tools Use it on mobile devices when uh, people don't have access too much to uh, to computers. Then uh, a tablet or a mobile phone app uh, is very useful. You also want to record uh, these webinars. That's what I'm doing now too. And uh, you can even live stream it if you want in some tools. You also want it to be platform independent because some people use an iPhone, others use an Android, uh, some use it on the Windows computer. And then, uh, yeah, it should work on all these devices and uh, in, in different browsers. You want also that there's attention for privacy and security. You don't want people uh, bombing your meetings and breaking in. That's a serious danger with some tools. And um, your privacy needs to be protected. You also don't want that your meetings that are quite serious business that uh, other people hear what you say and uh, can, can use it at their wish, especially big companies that, that get away with your stuff. So that's a bit of the, the exercise you need to do is check your requirements. And uh, yeah, what's an important uh, thing there, I, I forgot a few is, uh, I think it dropped out here. It's the, the user friendliness is a very important one. And um, yeah, that, that's really uh, the, the look and feel of it is also an important thing. So now I'm gonna mention a few of these tools. Everybody knows Skype and uh, in the beginning, it was quite an efficient tool, but it got a bit overloaded with things and uh, the maintenance has been not so good, but it's still a free tool that you can use uh, and you can do most of, uh, of these things and the most important things. There's Google Hangouts. Uh, if you uh, want to rely on big tech, uh, of course it sounds for free, but you also pay with your privacy in some way. So, uh, but it's very useful. There are smooth tools and they work nicely from the browser. And there's this tool, Yitzi Meet. It's completely uh, open source, 100% open source. It's quite safe to use. Uh, there's encryption. Um, there's all kinds of nice things that you can use also from this word cloud that's available for us. There's uh, Zoom, the free version. You can just uh, register, download it, and, uh, and share the link with others, and they can use it. But it has some serious uh, privacy and security issues. Uh, that you need to be really aware about. And um, I've posted some uh, some links on, on reviews of Zoom where they point out these, uh, these vulnerabilities that you get. So it's both on security and on, on privacy that uh, Zoom is uh, lagging behind compared to other tools. And uh, yeah, you really need to weigh the user friendliness of a tool like Zoom with uh, what you pay for that uh, in terms of giving up security and privacy. It's a, it's a conscious choice you need to make, but also since you are dealing with a lot of other people, uh, you're also making that choice for them. So be aware of that. Then there's uh, Skype for Business or Teams. Those are uh, paid products. So I'll go now to the paid products that are mostly used by the corporate sector and in big organizations because these are expensive tools, but they work quite well. Uh, of course, in your organization, you need to have uh, trainings on that uh, to get used to these tools and keep the, your IT department needs to keep them uh, up to date. You have the Zoom Pro or Enterprise Edition uh, where you pay for more features, but you don't get more security or privacy necessarily. So you always have to check that. It's not that the free version is more vulnerable than the paid versions. So um, always uh, keep an eye on what you pay for. And there's GoToMeeting, also an expensive product, but uh, also very smooth uh, to use. Um, so basically the conclusion is to, to check your uh, requirements against uh, what these tools offer. And of course, it also depends on your budget. Now, uh, I want to talk a little bit about trends um, because Zoom is very trendy. Uh, it's also for private use. Many uh, of my friends, uh, they organize uh, Zoom parties uh, because nowadays with birthdays, we cannot visit each other. Uh, and what we see is that Skype was always more popular. This comes from Google Trends. So in the last year, Skype, that's the orange line, has always been more popular. But since the corona crisis, there is an uh, enormous boom in the use of uh, Zoom. And the funny thing is there's also a difference in uh, the regions. So we see that uh, 
in in the United States and uh, some countries in in South America, uh, Australia. Uh, Zoom is more popular, and we see Indonesia also here second place. Uh, well, in Eurasia, we mostly still use uh, Skype if you compare the two tools. I didn't compare all the tools, but this gives a bit of an indication of the popularity. But never confuse popularity with features. So your starting point is not popularity. Your starting point is which features do you want? The word cloud of the previous slide. Now, when you have chosen a tool, there are a few more tools that you might want to use next to your um, online meeting tool uh, for online collaboration. And a great suggestion there is to use in parallel to your online meeting a Google document. It's a web-based uh, tool where you can share documents, spreadsheets, and presentations and work on it uh, live with each other. So when everybody's locked in through the, through the browser to uh, a Google Doc, you can simultaneously edit the document. And uh, this increases very much the efficiency of the um, of the meeting because the, the output is created while you're doing the, the meeting. I've even seen some meetings in our projects where we co-designed uh, the notes of the meeting. So everybody uh, adds to the, to the notes of the meeting and immediately after the, the meeting uh, it's, uh, or during the meeting it's already shared with everybody. So very useful to do that. Also to collaboratively work on uh, presentations is very useful. Another nice tool uh, that I came across is uh, Mural. Um, in many of your uh, sessions in the, in the project, your workshops, you have these post-it sessions, uh, pressure cooker sessions, uh, world cafes, and all these nice things that social scientists uh, use in their uh, meetings. And uh, yeah, I can uh, imagine that some people miss those uh, post-it uh, sessions. Well, this is a nice digital uh, way of still using it. And uh, you can have a look at it. It's called uh, Mural, and uh, it's for digital brainstorming, online uh, uh, visual collaboration. That might be very useful if you still want to continue with your, um, with your workshops in a similar way as you planned. And uh, these tools are all for free. Then, yeah, before you start even your online meeting, you need to do some planning and preparation. So here is some uh, good advice. First of all, you need to share the agenda and the background information before your teleconference. It's very important um, because you want to be efficient. And when people are prepared for the meeting, uh, it works most efficiently. So make sure that all these documents and the agenda are, are shared, uh, preferably then in a Google Doc, so people can even open it during the meeting uh, and you can collaboratively work on it and they can even see the last changes that you made. It's very important to define the roles. Who's the host, who's the moderator, and who takes notes? Now, the host is normally uh, the person who hosts the system. That's not necessarily the moderator. And um, like in this uh, session, uh, the host uh, yeah, is, is Yitzi, it's some, somewhere outside of, uh, of our uh, control. Uh, the moderator, uh, that, that's me, but I do it together with Nadine, who's collecting those questions and brings them up in the plenary. And it's always good to have somebody who's not presenting to take care of all the other uh, things uh, behind the scenes, so it doesn't disturb the presenter. And uh, we need a person who takes uh, notes. Uh, this is not a meeting, it's a webinar, so uh, we re record everything, but uh, it's essential that you decide who takes the notes. It's also very important to, uh, to make sure that everybody makes it to the meeting and you don't get any confusion. Therefore, the preferred way is to send electronic invitations. And uh, this is cross-platform, so you can use uh, Google Calendar to send out these invitations to all other systems uh, and, uh, and it will work, similar from Outlook. And uh, yeah, they, it will adapt to their time zones in their systems automatically. So that's the preferred way to avoid uh, confusion, but also to have automatic reminders set to the people and uh, make sure that the participation rate is as high as possible. Another advice about when to plan your meeting, of course, you have to deal with time zones, but you also have to deal, especially in these corona times when people are together with their families at home, staying at home, um, that you avoid the times that they are with their family. So avoid lunch and dinner seminars because that disturbs the, the family uh, dynamics. And um, also for people who are not having their families around, uh, it is also important that you uh, give them a break because yeah, like me, I'm the whole time uh, behind the computer doing my work, even in the evenings. But at lunch, I'm not waiting for a lunch uh, seminar. 
uh, I just want to have my sandwiches and not behind the screen. So um, take care of uh, the rhythm of others. And uh, I, I know that you cannot always avoid lunch and dinner seminars, but uh, keep, be conscious about it because you will lose participation. You will lose attention during those meetings. And uh, many people uh, choose for other priorities uh, during those timings. Another good advice is stick always to the same tool because people need to get used to new tools. So if every time you use a different tool, then uh, yeah, every time you spend a lot of time with explaining people uh, where things are, how, how it works, and uh, which uh, browser gives the best performance. So um, test these things with your little team, how it, uh, which one works best for you and in your case, and with all your requirements from the word cloud that I showed, and then stick to that one and don't swap all the time. Because also you get confusion with the links that you send out because people will use the wrong one and uh, are expecting the wrong things. And as I mentioned, security, safety is very important. Now, uh, we are aware with these corona times that we need to keep the viruses out and don't uh, affect each other or get affected. So uh, that consciousness is there for a virus. But in the online world, there's a lot of bad things going on. And you certainly don't want to have your online meetings or webinars affected by that, by people who uh, break in in your uh, session and show things that you don't want the world to see. So some advice there is to, to use a unique link for the meeting. Don't use the same link every time. Uh, add password protection if your tool allows it. can be a requirement for you because then the link will be longer with a lot of uh, uh, numbers and characters uh, and it's hard to... Uh, to guess for a, um, for a hacker. So don't make the link public. A uh, big mistake is to put it out on websites and on uh, social media. It's not always to avoid, and it's also uh, a bit of a trade-off. You want people to access especially your webinar, but on the other hand, you want to avoid uh, serious problems with security. So um, yeah, one solution is to use a waiting room or lobby function of your tool, which means that everybody has to wait until you allow them as the the moderator, you allow them to come into your digital uh, meeting. And another way of doing it is to, uh, to have people registered and uh, you keep uh, track of the participants. And uh, yeah, that's also important if you want to do monitoring and evaluation of your participants, not to keep it completely open. Um, so some things to consider when you, you plan this, but something you also should take really seriously. Then there are a few things you need to do before the online meeting. You need to make sure that you have a good internet connection and generally uh, cabled internet is preferred over Wi-Fi. And you can have some backup options. So if the, the internet is breaking, uh, you might want to switch to, uh, to your phone tethering function and use your uh, 4G bundle. Uh, so make sure that you have a, a good backup option that your bundle has enough uh, megabytes or gigabytes that you want to use and uh, have this backup. Uh, I myself, I use uh, DLAN. It was uh, mentioned yesterday in the plenary of IHE. That is that you get your internet through a cable, but then from your power network in your room, these are very nice and not so expensive things that you can use at home, especially if you have a big house. I don't have a big house, but the cabled version is much faster than the Wi-Fi. Um, so this goes over my power line to my router and it works perfect. Then if you use a camera, then please make sure that your room looks professional, that you look professional, uh, that the light source is good, that you test it before the meeting. You see uh, when I switch on later my camera after sharing these slides, you will see that I have my uh, have a little bit of branding sticked to my door. And a little anecdote is that uh, on my preview, it looked uh, mirrored. So I printed a mirrored version. And then when I uh, practiced this with Nadine, uh, she said it's mirrored. And uh, so it also differs with how you see it in your preview and something in uh, people, a person sees on the other side. So it's also good to practice it with somebody on the other side. So my guideline is always, uh, like with lectures, always be there at least 15 minutes before the participants to test uh, stuff and make sure it works. So I could still hang up the, the non-mirrored one so the audience can see it in, uh, in the right uh, format. And yeah, if you have pets or kids around, uh, keep them out, go to a room where you're not disturbed, or if there's people outside uh, doing works uh, that disturb, uh, yeah, take care of all these things. It's much more professional. And then for sound, yeah, very important that you uh, do a sound check before the meeting. 
And uh, that, that's very, very important. Often the sound fails and uh, invest in a good microphone or a headset. It's so much better than uh, many cheap uh, laptop uh, microphones that are also very directional. The IHE uh, default laptops, uh, especially the older versions, they, they have this problem. So if you're with two people uh, at the microphone, you often can hear only the one just in front of the microphone. So that's a good investment to, uh, to have a good headset or a good microphone. Then some other advice just before the online meeting is uh, if you plan to share your screen like me, then uh, it's very important that you close all the software and documents that you will not use because you can make a little mistake and people can see your emails coming in and there's a lot of privacy information there. So uh, if you want to share this Word document that you see in the picture, then of course make sure that you don't share also your emails in the background. And uh, if you want to show things, make sure that those documents and software are already started. So what I did before this Yitzi meeting, I already put my PowerPoint in presentation mode. And from Yitzi, I shared that uh, screen. And uh, you couldn't see me browsing to the documents in the, in the Windows File Explorer and uh, taking time to open a PowerPoint, etc. That all looks very unprofessional. Same with browser tabs, keep them open if you want to show things. I already did that also for this meeting. I, I will demonstrate a few of those things. Um, really good things to do to make it smooth and professional. So you have in uh, different tools some choices to share your desktop, the full screen desktop, versus sharing a specific window or versus uploading it to, uh, to the platform. There are trade-offs there. So, Sharing your full desktop, I advise that if you want to share uh, software tools which have many windows, because if you share a specific window and you get a pop-up pop up from your model or your GIS software, then uh, your participants can't see it. Therefore, it's important that you use that function to share the full desktop. If you don't have it, like with a PowerPoint, you only share the window of your PowerPoint and uh, not other things that's much more professional so they don't see uh, skype messages or uh, whatsapp or facetime coming in they only see that window that you use uh, the, and then the third option is to upload your presentation but there we face uh, problems for example during the msc defenses that uh, uh, skype for business is not really consistent in that that uh, for some people uh, the presenter could go to the next slide, etc. And for other people, it just stays on the first slide. And uh, yeah, it's sometimes unpredictable or not intuitive how, uh, how this works. But why is that option there then? Uh, well, I can advise you to use that option if uh, your bandwidth is very low, because then uh, sharing screens takes up more bandwidth than uploading your file once, pre uh, preferably before the meeting, and have uh, everybody uh, more locally on their screens. Uh, or through their own internet provider instead of having a direct connection with you when you have a low bandwidth. So all, all these things you have to think about. Then you have the online meeting, like uh, this webinar. Uh, you have to set the rules. Also, there are many trade-offs. If you have low bandwidth, like in many uh, of our conditions in the Global South, uh, then you really need to limit the amount of video connections and sharing of screens. Try to minimize this as much as possible. Instead, you point people to the documents you've sent in advance or look together in, your, in the browser to a Google document or a Google presentation because that doesn't take the bandwidth of the full connection uh, end to end. On the other end of the spectrum, where you have really good internet and you want to achieve maximum attention of the participants, uh, it's important that everybody switches on their video during the discussion so you can see that they're not drifting off and they will also not do that because they know uh, people are watching them. And the same with the microphones, you keep them unmuted because then uh, they cannot interact with uh, family members or colleagues uh, with things that are coming in and disturb your whole meeting. However, you also want to avoid noise and echoes. And in that case, you want to mute all the microphones except the one of the speaker. That's especially advised during webinars. But also during meetings, I can recommend only unmute the microphone of the speaker. Uh, also in the discussion, so uh, for a smooth operation, their raise hand functions are, are useful. So only people who uh, speak uh, have their microphone open because it's the right of the strongest in these tools. So the people who have the most noise even if it's background noise, they will take over the, uh, the sound of all the participants and they cannot hear the discussion anymore. So be aware of these different trade-offs. 
And then good advice uh, for meetings and for webinars is use the chat function for the questions because the presenter uh, gets distracted uh, if there's every time questions coming in. And we know that people have lots of questions during uh, webinars, but it's also nice then in the end to summarize it. That's a, a big difference with face-to-face -face, where you would go immediately maybe into the discussion, but uh, you can't do that in online tools because it uh, disturbs the flow and you cannot have immediate response because it suppresses the, uh, the voice of other people. And uh, that's not uh, that's not good practice to uh, to do. So use the chat. Then at the online meeting, you also would like to start a bit informally. So while people are warming warming up, figuring out how the things work, testing their sound, you hear a lot of noises and crisps and everything. Um, then uh, you can use that time to have a bit of a, a nice informal chat. Huh? So how are you surviving these Corona times, uh, working at home? Is it okay? Um, how's your family, etc., etc. Use that time to uh, also touch base with each other. It's also still a social thing that you miss with face. Uh, and when you have a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting, you always have a social thing to do. But here it's important to break the ice in the beginning. And there are always latecomers. So uh, use this time to get in touch with each other. Then introduce the agenda and the roles and also the rules. And then the person who, uh, who has that role keeps, keeps an eye on the questions from the participants to raise hands and uh, yeah, if things go wrong, you need to have a person who also informs you about it, can be remotely. Uh, what I often do during my webinars is to have a separate uh, Telegram chat or WhatsApp chat open where the person who helps me uh, informs me when things go wrong so I can uh, still solve it while, uh, while I'm not touching uh, or interfering with, uh, with the broadcast. And time management is very important. We don't want to uh, spend a lot of uh, long time online uh, monotonously uh, talking. So it's very important that you work on those expectations in the agenda and uh, don't spend more time than needed. And if you if it takes more time, yeah, then just uh, uh, postpone uh, the meeting or yeah, plan another meeting uh, where you continue the discussion. And like in a face-to-face -face meeting, also always ask if recording is okay. In this case, I'm recording, and I, I, you were informed about that, and uh, this will be used in uh, uh, in our communications, and it will be posted so other people can who couldn't attend, and if you want to see things uh, back, can uh, use this recording. And a few words about webinars. They are very similar uh, good practices as uh, online meetings, but uh, in addition, you want to have a web page with all the info where uh, people can go to and where you also store the recordings, you publish it there, you give some guidelines on how to use it, you have the agenda there. You want moderator and presenters in, in really uh, different roles. It's preferable to use specific webinar software. You can do it in other software like uh, I mentioned, but uh, for really good moderation and for safety reasons, it's uh, recommended to use uh, webinar software. Um, that's also important that you take care of m and &E because webinars also have often a function for uh, marketing. So you also want to monitor how many people, where they're from, uh, et cetera, and keep in touch with them uh, for follow-up things and also for your reporting and your projects. Um, so this Friday, I'm organizing a, a weekly uh, webinar that I do every Friday since the Corona crisis with uh, Kurt Menkes, the co-author of my book. And uh, if you want to see how such a webinar goes, then uh, you can go to uh, the link that's in the lower right of the screen and uh, you can register. We do that now for safety reasons, but it's free to join. And uh, this Friday, we're going to talk about catchment delineation in GIS. And, uh, it's probably for many of you uh, an interesting topic. Then, yeah, when you record your meetings and uh, your uh, webinars or even your courses for the internet, I do that also a lot, then uh, you could also need tools for that. There are paid tools. Uh, at IHE, we use Camtasia. I use personally Screencast-O-Matic. It just depends on what you like and what's available. But if uh, you don't have a budget, there are also very good open source tools around. Uh, there's uh, OpenShot. Uh, you see the screenshot here on the right. There's uh, Caden Live or uh, Lives or Lives. Uh, on the knowledge platform, which I'm going to show you in a bit, uh, we've posted a, a link where you can see a review of these different tools. 
Also there you have to take care of the features. You might not want all the possible functionality in the world because you can get lost. Maybe a simple tool is much better, but that's uh, up to your requirements. Now here at IHE, uh, we are also very much using Big Blue Button in Moodle. And although we use that in education, it's also a very useful tool to use uh, uh, for webinars or for uh, online meetings. And um, yeah, it's open source like Yitzi that we're using now. So, and it has uh, a lot of good functionality. Therefore, I would like to show you now a video uh, that in uh, six minutes guides you through uh, the functionality of Big Blue Button and gives you maybe some inspiration on how you can uh, use that yourself. So I'm going to stop the sharing now of uh, the, the PowerPoint and I'm going to start the video. It's a nice thing about Yitzi. You well, can in this video, we're going to show you how to use Big Blue Button as a moderator and presenter capabilities. First thing is you'll see you'll be invited to join the audio, just as the viewers. I can join listen only, but I'm going to join with the microphone. When I do, Big Blue Button puts me into an echo test. Just lets me check my audio. Test, test. Sounds good. Now I join. When I join, I see the presentation area here. Again, the public chat is visible by default and the users list. When you join as a moderator, you have a square icon, which says this is all the moderators, the students, the viewers join with circles. When I'm talking, you can see that I'm highlighting. I can mute myself here by just pressing the mute button. When a student unmutes himself, you'll hear them, but you can also click and you can mute them as well. You may also see students joined listen only. When a student's joined listen only, they can't talk, but they can hear you as well. Students can also set their status, which means their initials will be replaced by an icon. Here, you can see happy face, and I'm going to clear all the icons as well. As the instructor, you can start and stop the recording anytime. So here I'm going to do start recording, and a message appears. And I can also click it again to pause the recording. And I can start and pause the recording as many times as I want during the session. Other moderator capabilities, I can mute all the users. I can mute everyone except myself. And I can also lock the viewers down as well. So this means I can prevent them from sharing webcams, sharing microphone, public chat, private chat, as much as you want. This one here is if you want to prevent them from seeing everyone else's webcams. It means that they will only see your webcam, but you'll see all the students' webcams. To apply it, just close, and then you'll see an icon here next to their name that says they're locked. If you want to unlock the capabilities, go back to lock viewers. I can just turn off the locks, and then they'll be able to do everything again. You also have the ability to put students into breakout rooms. To do this, you choose Create Breakout Rooms. It shows you a list of students. I can drag and drop a student between each room. I can choose a number of breakout rooms, a duration, and I can also allow students to choose which breakout room they want to join. Let's set it to five minutes and I click Create. You'll see the breakout rooms tab appear to the left. And now you can see students, uh, the count of students as they go into breakout rooms. You have the ability to join the audio in a breakout room and you can also fully join the breakout room. If you do that, it'll just give you the invitation to join and it'll bring you into the breakout room just like the students. You can join the audio, you can see the students in the room, and when you're done, you just close and you're back to the main room. At some point, you may wish to end the breakout rooms before the end time. You just click end. I'll rejoin the audio. And we're back in the main room. Students are all back, ready to pick up where you left off. Let's turn to the presentation area. Here, by default, the whiteboard tools are selected. So I can use the pen tool to draw. I have a series of tools here as well, which I can use. So let me go to a blank slide. If I want to draw, I can do a little bit of drawing. And as the instructor, I can also give the students the ability to draw as well by turning on multi-user whiteboard. When I do that, you can see their icons move and they can draw on their own layer. They can't overwrite anything. And you as a presenter have the ability to turn on and off multi-user whiteboard anytime you want. If I turn it off, all the, all the ability to draw will be frozen. If I turn it off, students can no longer draw. And if I clear, it clears all the whiteboard marks. As a presenter, you have some controls here on the left-hand side. I can start a poll, upload a presentation, or share a YouTube video. Let's start with upload a presentation. I can bring this up, 
I can browse my files, and here I've got something ready to go. This slide has a question on it. It could be a slide deck of 20, 40, 100 slides. Very efficient to share a presentation because it only downloads once to the user's computer, unlike trying to share your desktop, which we'll show in a moment. Here the slides have A, B, C, and D. Let's say I want to do a poll and want to ask the students what is the result. Because it's actually formatted just fairly simply, Big Blue Button actually realizes that you have a poll for A, B, C, D. You also have the polling option here, and I can choose A, B, C, D. So if I do it, the students are all presented with a poll. I can see there's one response, and I can publish the results. When I'm done polling, I just close the poll. And then I can clear the polling marks as well, because they're just whiteboard. If I want to share a YouTube video, I click here, choose Share YouTube Video. I have a URL ready to go. I just click it, I do Share Video. The presentation area will become the video, and it will start playing, and all the students will see the same video. You as the instructor can scrub ahead to the video. They'll all scrub to head to the same point, start playing. And if you pause, they pause as well. It was a really easy way to share a video with your students. If I want to stop sharing the video, choose stop sharing, and then choose stop sharing the video. It goes back to the presentation area. You also have the ability to share the screen. So I'm here, I'm using Chrome, which makes it really easy. I click once to share the screen, it gives me some options here, and I can choose an application window, Chrome tab, or I can just go back, leave it at default, and choose here my entire screen. And then I click share. In a moment, the screen sharing will start up. And you'll see this kind of screen on screen effect just because I'm sharing my screen while I'm viewing it. Most of the times you'll just go to an application and you can start showing how the application works and this is what users will see. When you go back, you can just stop the screen sharing anytime you want. And this becomes part of the recording as well. Finally, as moderator, you actually have the ability to uh, make someone presenter. So you can make someone else presenter. And if I do that, Tara can move the mouse around and I can see the mouse moving. You have the ability to remove any user and you can also promote them to moderator as well. Finally, when you're done, you have the ability to choose log out or if you want, you can end the meeting, which would kick everybody out and start the recording. And that's it. That's an overview of how to use Big Blue Button as a moderator with the capabilities of presenter. So uh, I hope that's uh, useful. Um, I'm gonna stop the YouTube video. Yeah, we move. So uh, let's go back to the last slides of the presentation. Uh, just a moment, I need to start it first in, in the right way. Yep. And there we go. So the demo of Big Blue Button, very complete in terms of uh, features that uh, that you would like to have, uh, very complete. And uh, I think it uses similar uh, open source libraries as Yitzi because it has uh, some functionality that uh, Yitzi also has. Um, what we also like to point out is that there's uh, an extension of the deadline for uh, designing and planning online courses. It's an online course that we offer to uh, to you and you can uh, register until uh, this Sunday. Um, very useful if you plan to make online courses and uh, yeah, can really advise you to, to follow this one. Um, now I want to show, before we go to the discussion, I want to show you uh, our knowledge platform. So I'm gonna share a tab for our browser now. <clears throat> in Chrome, so I can share a Chrome tab, there it comes. So you see now uh, the Chrome uh, tab with uh, our knowledge platform. So the, the link, uh, you just go to our open courseware. I think uh, Nadine can put the link also in the chat. And then uh, you will find this uh, page easily, the UC2 e-learning knowledge platform for partners. And we try to uh, put there useful things for you to uh, learn about uh, distance communication, so the tools have been discussed here, um, online collaboration tools, some good practice stuff here that I discussed, and some, uh, some links. 
uh, distance teaching. It gives uh, links to, to useful webinars and other resources and, and good practices, very useful to, to check out. But also we would like to hear those things from you. So if you have something to share, uh, you think is useful for the Deep Sea 2 partners, please let us know. There's this tab webinar that you uh, probably already found where you can find uh, announcements of our webinars, uh, links to it, but also the recordings of previous ones in this uh, series. Uh, questions and answers. We are really curious to hear about your uh, ideas, solutions and challenges. So uh, mail them to us and we'll post them here. So that's what I wanted to uh, show to you. Go back to, to Yitzi. And I'm um, going back to the presentation because it's almost uh, time for the discussion. So it's uh, time for the discussion and I'm going to uh, give the word to, uh, to Nadine to come up with some highlights from the uh, from the chat box, the questions. Nadine, can you unmute yourself? Yes, I did. Thanks, Hans. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I'll stop sharing so you can also see me. Okay. I don't have my camera because my lighting is not good, so I prefer to no problem. stay dark. <laughs> uh, I hope that everybody was uh, could follow the webinar well. Uh, just to repeat for the ones that missed it at the beginning, if you have a question, uh, please open the chat. It's You can open it on the left, on the bottom, third icon. And there you can also introduce yourself. I will keep an eye on the chat and we'll mention the questions here so we can answer them for you. There was a question by Lauren. Um, she was curious. As you said, many of our partners may not have strong internet or use data networks to connect to the internet. Do any of these platforms that you mentioned earlier, I think it was under the, when you were talking about the tools, you'd see um, Zoom, Skype for Business, require more or less bandwidth? Uh, that's a very good question, of course. Um, really some requirements you need to take care of. What we know is that uh, that all of these tools probably take care of your bandwidth. So they will uh, let you know. So in Yitzi, uh, for example, if you go to your uh, video screen or one of the others, then in the upper left, it will show you the performance, the internet connection. If it's uh, green, it means it's good. Uh, if it's yellow, it means it's less, and red, it means it's no good. And it will also adjust uh, the video quality to, uh, to your uh, performance of your internet. Uh, other tools don't do that very explicitly, but they do it. So, uh, but it really depends on the tool how well it does. And it's really something, uh, yeah, I can, I can check if I can figure it out. For video platforms, uh, we found that YouTube is very good on that because uh, it will just check your, your bandwidth and uses the, the resolution that is appropriate for your bandwidth. But definitely Yitzi takes care of that. Okay, and then um, there was a more of a comment by Laura. She said, oh, whoops, I just shared the link to this meeting via Twitter. So would you yeah. say that is okay once the webinar is open or would you still discourage people from doing that? I would discourage it because uh, people can simply with this link enter uh, this meeting room. And if you guys want, you can start sharing screen and you can imagine what kind of screens you can share uh, during this meeting that we are not interested in. So uh, the, if your tool allows uh, waiting room or lobby, then uh, then it's not so dangerous because then the moderator is always uh, available to let you in or not. Yeah, so would you then say that uh, Yitzi is a good platform for webinars? I think uh, if, so Yitzi, the version that we are using here is hosted somewhere else at Yitzi itself, but uh, you can also, because it's open source, implement it on your own servers in your institute or host it somewhere else where you can customize the things. So I think for webinars, it is really important to have a tool where you have this uh, uh, waiting room or lobby. So you control uh, the people who come in. Although, yeah, we love to uh, to have uh, have everything open for the whole world, especially me with open source and, and open data and these things. But there are just idiots around who break in. And I speak from my own experience. It happened to me. So therefore, I'm super careful these days. 
Um, so really, really be careful. And for webinars, uh, let people register. It also gives you some nice uh, data on where they're from. And uh, you can create a community. You can follow up, uh, of course, within the GDPR rules. Um, but, but avoid uh, strange people who want to simply uh, disturb your, uh, your flow. So generally, no, don't put it out on social media. Only put the registration link there. Yeah. And there's a question from Wim Doeven. I think you already answered it now, but I will just repeat it. Maybe you have something to add. Is Yitzi open access and safe to use? It is completely open source, 100%. It has uh, on the knowledge platform, I've posted a link about the safety of Yitzi. It's, uh, it's generally okay, ex except that it has that uh, is missing that feature of uh, having a lobby or waiting room. But uh, the communication is encrypted. Um, there's uh, links you can uh, make yourself, and they have some advice on creating this link. So this one is called DPC2 Webinar Distance Communication with some underscores. Uh, chances are really low that people uh, have exactly the same link. But if you call it a uh, test, then probably uh, many <laughs> people around have uh, that link. So there's a bit of a discussion about it, but Jitsi is seen as a, generally a safe tool. Uh, also the corporate uh, ones, uh, Skype for Business and um, uh, GoToMeeting, uh, the Cisco tools are, are really safe. Uh, and Zoom generally not, So, but it's very popular. So that's the trade-off. Okay, thanks. Um, there are no more questions in the chat. We can also take uh, questions. Uh, Verbally, oh, there's more questions coming in, that's good. Can you read it, Nadine? Oh, yeah. How to start with Yitzi? Do we have to download the software from their website? No, it's very easy. You just go to uh, to Google and you say, uh, you type Yitzi, and then uh, when you get to the site of Yitzi, I can even show that in a tab, by the way, that's better. <clears throat> I will show it until the point of starting one, otherwise it doesn't work, of course. So I'm gonna share a tab here. Okay, so I googled uh, Yitzi and there I find uh, yitzi.org. Always check the URL before you click on that, that it comes really from the organization. It's also one of the safety advices. And then there's this uh, Yitzi Meet. That's what we're uh, doing uh, now. So you click on it. And uh, there you have a choice, either install it on your own server, see the code. So the whole source code is uh, public, really in the spirit, the good spirit of open source. And uh, here you can just say start a call. When you click that button, here you type the name of the meeting. And when you press go, it starts right away. And uh, you can share that link with others and you can go back to it. So you can close the meeting and you can uh, go back to it or anybody who has the link can, uh, can go to it. And the nice thing about the concept of Yitzi is, if I can explain it a little bit, is as soon as the first person has entered the link, the room exists and it uh, evaporates if the last one has left. And you can start it again. So when another person starts it again, the room exists again. And uh, yeah, when the last one leaves, it's closed again. So this link that we used for this one is, uh, you can experiment with it and uh, try it yourself after this meeting because it will still exist when you enter this uh, virtual room. I'm gonna stop sharing it now, but it's as simple as that. That's the, the free version. You simply start it from your uh, Chrome browser. It has a plugin for Chrome. Uh, in the same way as you started this one. Okay, thanks. I see another from Solomon. Which one do you prefer from your experience for online lecture? Big Blue Button or Yitzi? I think Big Blue Button is the best. But a Big Blue Button is not something that you just simply start from your browser. You really need to have it implemented in a good way, uh, preferably integrated in your e-learning environment, such as Moodle. And then also your students are uh, registered in, in Moodle and uh, Big Blue Button can then use that, uh, that database. And uh, these breakout rooms are really great to, to use. And uh, yeah, if you can configure it well, uh, you have the right servers, you have uh, IT support, then, uh, then I think that's the, really the preferred solution. And I would rather see doing these webinars in uh, Big Blue Button also to you guys. Uh, we're gonna see if we can do that. Yeah, because we we tried, but then um, we realized it was not open. Yeah, we need to register yeah. people. Yeah, and uh, maybe we can do that in the future uh, for my own webinars that I I do with Zoom, which I want to get rid of in the future. Uh, we register now the people uh, for security reasons, 
Uh, and you can easily set that up with uh, MailChimp with a free account. So that's what I use now. Somebody uh, helped me with that uh, to, to explain how it works with a nice video guy in Canada. And uh, I followed his instructions and uh, I could do that. Okay, thanks. Next time I provide some of these papers that I uh, stuck on the door. <laughs> Lauren would like to speak. I get here a message. Okay, uh, Lauren, you can unmute yourself. Go ahead. I don't dare show my video, but I can unmute my microphone. <laughs> Great, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Hans, and, and thank you, Nadine, and the rest of the team. Uh, this is a really helpful webinar, so I appreciate the effort that you've done to put this together. Um, I just have a quick clarification question on Big Blue Button. Does that mean right now it's only a, we can only use it for people who are registered within the IHE network? And if we were to host uh, a series of webinars with people outside of IHE, we should use Jitsi for the time being? Uh, yes, or you need to have your own infrastructure to host a big blue button. So it's open source. It can also be used standalone, but then you really need to install it somewhere on a server or you pay for the service, I guess, at uh, big blue button itself. As far as I know, but I might be incorrect, you cannot uh, start it from a browser like Jitsi. They don't have that functionality. Okay, thank you very much. Any more questions from the audience? Somebody wants to mute, unmute the microphone, uh, take the word, use, uh, use the raise hand function or show the camera. So we're also really curious to hear from our partners how they are uh, dealing with the situation and uh, distance communication and e-learning. Uh, for us, it's uh, always from our side, how we see the things and they can be quite different than in uh, conditions yeah. of our, our partners in the Global South. So, so I really hope that we get some feedback from you. I was also curious, uh... Maybe the details are not so important, but when you said that uh, here it's important not to plan a meeting in lunchtime. Yeah. So maybe there are other details for other cultures that are more important to take into account when you're planning a meeting. Good point. I think indeed uh, prayer times, such a thing you don't want to disturb, but you, uh, as soon as you go transboundary, things become a bit difficult because the timings are also uh, different. But certainly you have to take care of the, the social context of the people, uh, their personal conditions, but also the timing of things, events in their, their countries. Uh, Wim Dufa asked in a specific question for Quan, how he is dealing with distance communication in Vietnam students and in his projects. So it would be very nice to hear. Maybe you want to try to unmute yourself and uh, and say something or write it in the chat. Also, feel free to send us an email if you have no time now. And then we can also share the experience of our partners on the platform that we have. That might also trigger a discussion. Yeah. You like to speak. Oh. I see you raise hand. So when somebody raises a hand, I can uh, see a, a message popping up. Uh, maybe you also saw that. So uh, yeah, you can unmute yourself and. Uh, and tell us. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just afraid. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Wim, for asking question. Uh, thank you very much, Hans. Uh, yeah, it's going from Vietnam. Yeah, Welcome. yeah. So yeah, uh, we also do something uh, online. This is a meeting quite often here, but uh, this time we don't have yet a student if uh, because school still close. Um, uh, but maybe next week start we will uh, do some uh, online teaching for students. Some of my colleagues are also doing it. They most likely they are doing with Zoom. Uh, I do a lot of meeting with my colleagues by Zoom and Skype. Normally small group, five to six, eight people. So it's work very well here. So I think in Vietnam the internet is quite okay. So we we. Uh, we work with this file. Some of my colleagues also teaching with a big class, I think 30, 50 people students. And I think I, I saw them also doing well on the, well, what did they say on Facebook? Yeah. So, but I, I think now today I learned a bit, especially when you mentioning about the uh, security of Zoom again, and also you introduce some new system GC or PPP, I think we we may try that 
uh, in the coming days. Yeah, that's fine for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing that. It's really good to hear that uh, you are uh, uh, using things to, to be online in touch with your students and your colleagues. And also good to hear what kind of tools you use. And also good to hear uh, that uh, there are some useful things in the, in the presentation that you can uh, share with the others. Um, I was just wondering that uh, because the schools are closed, wouldn't that be uh, the opportunity to continue online? Or are they, are they closed that you're also not allowed to teach in that period, even online? Yes, so the school is closed in, uh, uh, I think, uh, one and a half months, actually after our Lunar uh, New Year holiday. And we start, so it's almost uh, two months now already. So since then, no school. But uh, but the online school start, I think, about one month ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Obviously, because of yeah. it's closed. Yeah, that's understandable, of course. It's not the limitation yeah. of uh, not not being able to to switch to online. It's really the holidays. Yeah. So you start uh, schooling and online teaching. Most most of uh, most of levels from secondary school to university. Nice. Yeah. That's good. And how do the students appreciate it? Yeah, I think. Um, uh, actually, I, I haven't really teached it, so I, I don't know. No. But uh, I found that uh, it was not really the difficult for students, but maybe more difficult for teacher, okay. lecturers, <laughs> because they just teaching and not really see students, and, <laughs> and they are maybe a little bit uh, impressed. <laughs> Some of my friends share on that, yeah. Yeah, we all have to adapt. Eh? These uh, students generally are uh, are quick with uh, new technology. Uh, well, uh, maybe some lecturers need a bit more time to get used to it. But uh, what we see is that this also gives a nice opportunity now in the in this Corona crisis that uh, yeah, even the most conservative uh, <laughs> lecturers have to do it because there is not much other choice. Yeah, it's nice to learn new things. Lifelong learning, also for lecturers. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think it's a great, some um, really a bit challenge, but maybe we need to adapt it a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Also, for the future of your curriculum, you can think of doing parts online and give more access to other people uh, in, in such a way who cannot physically come to your classroom. Yes, you're right. So, even for me, also, I'm during this day, I'm trying to learn some distant course, just online yeah. lectures. Yeah. Oh, that's great that you do that yourself because for me that's also an eye-opener if i look at online courses from others or from commercial organizations in netherlands who offer that how they do it yeah. you can learn a lot yeah. of good and bad things yeah yeah i saw several courses like uh, from wageningen university to delft they are offering so also video lectures there i think it's uh, really helpful yeah yeah Okay, thanks. That uh, was great to hear the experiences from uh, from Vietnam. Thanks, very cool. Thank you, Han. Thank you very much. I think uh, because of the time, we have to uh, round off. Uh, Nadine, any final words from your side? Things that came in? No. Well, I just saw last post by uh, Laura. She said the, there was a Guardian article shared by uh, IT's IT support uh, on the security insecurity of Zoom. So I think it's also nice that we share that one on the yeah. on the platform. There was a school in the Netherlands uh, stopping with Zoom uh, because some uh, bad things happened in the virtual classroom. And uh, yeah, it's all about being conscious about it, do the most to prevent it, and take those uh, guidelines very seriously. Yeah. Okay, uh, we're going to close uh, this webinar. Uh, thank you very much for attending. We will share the recordings as soon as possible. Uh, and uh, yeah, hope to see you in another uh, webinar. Don't forget to look at our knowledge sharing uh, platform and uh, get in touch with uh, DUPC2 to share uh, your solutions, your challenges, your questions with us. Hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>